My name is Caleb Kamari. Um, it's, my, so my, my wife was excited that I was coming to talk to you and she is a alum of, a, I guess, a personal in school, which is in Dallas, but she's like super psyched. Like, oh, I want to come. I want to see what they look like. <laughs> it's great to see them. I love these smiling faces. Um, and I've heard, I've heard a, a lot about your like club from um, Hunter's dad, who's like a, the, the biggest fan. I don't know if, if, if you guys have met him. I, I'm just gonna embarrass him a little bit. He's a hub, but yeah, no, he like he talks about about your competitions all the time. So, and, and, and it's, it's, it's really cool. so let's uh, let's start with a, a quick survey. So who here has taken a biology class? Okay, almost unanimous. Okay, so who here is not is you guys are all in high school, is that right? Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Let's say, who, who are juniors and seniors? Okay, so mainly juniors and seniors, a few freshmen and sophomores. Um, awesome, awesome. Great. Cool. So, my, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a assistant professor at Rice. I just started in January. Uh, my training is as an electrical engineer. So, I, 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 was, I studied electrical engineering as an undergraduate. Master's degree, and I got a PhD, and then I spent some time as a postdoctoral research fellow in a lab studying neuroscience. And so the, I'm going to talk to you today about the, the research that I do, which is sort of at the intersection of signal processing, which is um, really broadly what I would say is one of the things that electrical engineers do, uh, and neurobiology. Uh, and I think I think the brain is is, is fascinating. I hope you guys will. So, I also hope that maybe you'll learn something. I feel like those things out that I, yeah, it's still my responsibility to like try to teach you guys something. So, <laughs> see if that works or not. Um, okay. So, show, show and tell. Uh, and and this, the, these, these, these will become, I think I'm going to talk a little bit more about what, what these two things are uh, uh, in a second. Um, so these are devices that we use to record the activity of neurons. Okay. So who knows what a neuron is? Okay, right there. What's your name? Cells that are used in the brain and the rest of the nervous system. I think of the brain as being the most important part of the nervous system, but yeah, there's also neurons in your spinal cord, neurons in your skin that sense some of that send information. So I guess there, there are other cells that probably communicate. So like immune cells communicate with each other, right? That's how you respond when you get a cold and you end up like, with a bunch of stuff. Um, but brain neurons are um, among the only cells in the body that produce like real like signals that I would think of, which are like pulses of electricity. So as an electrical engineer, I like neurons because of the way that they communicate with each other is electricity. Okay, so these two things that I'm holding in my hand are, are ways that we can um, record the activity of neurons, um, either when they're sitting uh, in a dish, like if we pull them out of the brain, and disassociate them and then put them to a dish. So if you if you look at this, you'll see that it has a bunch of very, very small electrodes in the middle. Uh, and this we used to record neurons in in um, in, a, in a rat. And the rat's still alive and running around and, and doing stuff. Um, and so if you take this little screws, what you'll see is that um, we need to do this. Guess, guess. That's not going to work. Um, <laughs> so what you can see is a very small wire. So that wire is uh, about 40 microns in diameter coming out the bottom. And so that's the thing that goes into the rat's brain. Um, but 
and since it's only 40 microns in diameter, it's pretty delicate. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this around. If you guys want to push it out, look at it, and pull it back in, that would be awesome. So we'll start over here, and you guys can sort of circle these two things around. OK, cool. So we already answered the question, what is a neuron? Uh, yeah, got it. OK, so we'll see if we could do this. But I, I, I'm going to tell you, this, is, this, this talk is about a paper that was published in uh, Nature about a year ago. And it was very cool when it came out. Um, and what it's about is how the brain processes the sense of touch. And uh, rats have a very, they have a, a sensor that is very good at touching things. Um, any, any thoughts what that sensor is? Yeah. What's your name? Whiskers. Your whiskers, yeah, yeah. No, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. So whiskers can sense deflections of something like ten microns. How, okay, how, how, how big is ten microns? Small. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what, 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 so, so we got meters, we got millimeters, and then we got micrometers. That means that we're uh, uh, thousand, ten thousandths of a, of a millimeter. So that, that's just hard to picture. So the way I think about it is that your hair is about, about 10 microns a minute. So if, 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 if you like touch a hair, that, that's, that's about the, roughly about the sensitivity of, of rats' whiskers. Other things I do, okay, this is complete aside, but just because I think rats are really cool. Um, I, do you guys have any pet rats here? I have some. Yeah. You have a pet rat? I have some. You have some. They, they, they die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah they, they don't like that one. Um, what's your name?
you're a Sierra. Oh, not. You're Michaela. Okay, good. So that only actually learned two names. No, this name was Mateo. Oh, okay. So, okay. <laughs> now I know the names of the eight of you. Is that right? <laughs> So what, what are, what, what, what's an important part of it now? Uh, what, what's the axon? It's this big thing here, yeah. And what, is, what, what, is, what, what do axons do? Um, they, carry, they carry the... This, the I think you're right. I think it's three volts. 
Does anybody know why like the AA battery is 2.5 volts and the, 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 the point cell is 3 volts? This is going on so much. It's bigger? No. <laughs> the amount of amperage in the... No, that's not true either. <laughs> so, so, and I, and I can so, uh, and, and so, if you think about what, what you guys were saying, okay, so, um, the, what if, like, the D cells, do you guys, do you know what a D size battery looks like? I mean, I feel like maybe that's beyond, like, they don't use them anymore, but okay, you've seen them before, right? What's the voltage on a D cell battery? It's exactly the same, right? So that's, like, much bigger, right? So the size can't really make a difference. Um, and anyway, the point cell is smaller, so it, 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 and it has a higher voltage. And the amperage would be the amount of okay. What is what is what are amperes the unit? Yeah, you can, you can go ahead. Oh, okay. It's for the uh, flow of electricity, which is called current. Good, 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 good. good. Yeah. So you guys knew the answer. It was just too easy, and so you're like, oh, we won't see anything. Okay, good. Yes. So amps of, uh, and so the D cell can put out more current than the little double A, and that's why it's bigger. So there is there is something about power. Um, all right, I'm not going to waste my time on power. Anyway, the voltage of a neuron. Any ideas? All right, let's just let, let, let's see if you guys can do orders of magnitude. Who thinks? Uh, that it's uh, so. What's what's the voltage of the wall? By the way? Does anybody know? One ten. Yeah. Unless you're in England, in which case it's one two. What? Two forty. Uh, two twenty. Two forty is what you get if you get one of those fancy plugs in your house that like your your dryer plugs into. Okay. Okay. So okay, who thinks that a neuron's voltage is going to be as much as the wall? Show of hands. Okay. I love. I, I, I loved when I was your age. I loved little fun facts. So here's a really fun fact for you. Which do you think is more dangerous, the British power at 220 volts or the American power at 110 volts? Yeah. American power. Why? More current. <laughs> <laughs> more current. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. Uh, but you're, you're you're right. That is the right answer. So okay, I'll give you a hint. The American power is 110 volts at 60 cycles per second, 60 hertz. The British power is 220 volts at 50 cycles per second, 50 hertz. So, well, I just gave it away. Okay. So it turns out that, that normally the bigger voltage would mean that it was able to push more current. So your, your skin has a fixed resistance. It's, it's usually about 100 kilo ohms. So uh, a bigger voltage will mean more current. And current is normally what kills you. Current is what sort of burns things. Okay. So normally a bigger voltage would mean bigger trouble. But it turns out that your heart, the neurons in your heart, uh, which also has neurons, interestingly, uh, are sensitive to 60 hertz oscillations. And so when you get zapped with, with American power, it like stops your heart. Whereas when you get zapped with British power, it's just a little, it's far enough away from that like heart basic frequency that it doesn't kill you. So it's sort of crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if you're ever messing with the power in your house, the application for this fun fact is never touch it with both hands. Because if you touch it with both hands, then the path of the current goes through your body, through your chest, through your heart, and you die. Though, interestingly, if you know CPR and somebody's been electrocuted, that's one of the few situations where doing CPR will actually probably help them. So um, you should do CPR on the person because they very, they can they can recover with, with a, a great deal of uh, probability. Okay. The voltage on a neuron is, is uh, let's see, okay. so it's 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 actually something around uh, 70 millivolts. So the pulses that are being transmitted from neuron to neuron are actually end up being about 120 or 200 millivolts. So they're actually surprisingly large. It's interesting. So the little electrode things that you're passing around, when we actually stick an electrode near a neuron in the brain, the 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 things that we measure are actually might are much smaller, but if you can do this, if you can stick uh, an electrode inside a, a cell, which you can do with a really, really pointy piece of glass, um, then you can actually measure this voltage and find out that, it, that it's, it's much higher. And there's ions on the inside and ions on the outside that are different. You guys maybe learned this in your, in your class, uh, physiology class. Uh, uh, oh, okay, the 
answers on the slide, but I'm going to ask you guys anyway. So, what do you guys think are the most important ions for neurons? This is this is actually really just a test of whether can you take chemistry and you know what the, the symbols are for? Yeah. What's, so, uh, what's your 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 code? Code. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sodium. Uh huh. And then chloride. Uh huh. Uh, sodium and chloride. Okay, cool. Chloride. So there's there's chloride. Yeah, good, good. Sodium and chloride. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What else? Potassium and calcium. Oh, great. Okay, good. So you guys, you're real chemistry. Awesome. Okay, so I wish I shouldn't have told you this, but but uh, here's a here's here's another interesting fact. How do you remember which ions are in high concentration outside of cells, and how do you remember which ions are in high concentration inside cells? So you can see outside is sodium and chloride. If you put sodium and chloride together, what do you get? Good, good. Salt taste, salty, right? Okay. Um, where do you find a lot of salty water? Yeah, yeah. So the idea is that maybe life evolved in ocean water or something like ocean water. So the normal extracellular medium should be something like salt water. And so cells sort of typically, they push salt water out, and they build up something in the inside. So that, that it's a good heuristic. It turns out that the concentration of salt in your blood is not quite the same as ocean water. I think where our blood is saltier. Um, but it's, it's you know, roughly the same. So if you guys need to remember that. So the cell works a lot in order to, uh, to keep itself um, polarized, to keep that, that voltage. And this is what the signal looks like, the pulse signal that uh, neurons are generating. And basically the way that this is, so voltage pulses, normally you said current is the flow of electrons, right, right, man? So uh, but that's not necessarily true. Current is the flow of charged ions. So if you have sodium ions flowing, then that's a current. If you have potassium ions flowing, that's a current. And so this is actually, so when we measure a millivolt pulse, this is actually what we're measuring. We're measuring sodium flowing out, and then uh, potassium flowing in, into the cell. That's what, what gives rise to this pulse of electricity. Um, and it's really, so again, fun fact that's pretty useless. It turns out that this pulse of 100 something, 200 millivolts, is actually only order 100 ions, which is crazy. So that means like, 100, 100 sodium ions like, flow out, 100 potassium ions flow in, and that generates this big, measurable pulse of uh, electricity. That's because cells are very small. Okay, so here we get to the sci-fi part, which is where, so, okay, what I've been doing so far is teaching. So that's, these, th those are all facts that you guys will probably have to learn at some point if you end up being pre-meds or something like this. But hopefully you won't all be pre-meds, hopefully some of you will want to be electrical engineers or bioengineers or uh, neuroscientists. Um, I think chemists and geologists are pretty useless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and if you're thinking of another career, I, I'm happy to give you my opinion on it. Too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, it turns out that the things that maintain this membrane potential are channels that are, are pumps, like in, in the membrane of the cell, that are like pushing ions in both directions, right? Either pulling ions in or pushing ions out, right? They're pumps. Or they are channels. That means that they're holes that only let one thing go through them, like a positive ion, and they can close or open. So when the neuron wants to make a pulse, like a bunch of uh, channels open, and current flows through them in one direction, but only in one direction. So it turns out that there are some bacteria and some algae that have very cool ion channels that are sensitive to light. So one of them is this one called, uh, I actually don't know how to say it, um, <laughs> but it's, it's a single cell algae. It has these two little spots and it, and it, it spins, because it has a flagella, so it spins when it's living, and it, but it aligns itself to the sun, right? Because algae are plants, right? So they're getting energy from the sun. And the way that it does that is that it's sensitive to the light using this, this uh, ion channel, channel redoxin. There's two variants. This is, this is a picture of channel redoxin 2. Okay, 
Okay, so this is a picture of uh, a similar chemorops that comes from another algae. And then this is a picture of a chloride pump. Um, okay, so uh, from these pictures, right, so this is the outside of the cell, and this is the inside of the cell. What you learned about what ions like to be outside of the cell and what ions like to be inside of the cell. And hopefully what you know about ions and voltage. Here's, here's, okay, so this is the first like hard question. Okay, so if this, if this, if this ion channel is exposed to light and opens up and allows sodium to flow through like we see here, what will happen to the membrane voltage? So remember, the membrane voltage rests at something like minus 70 millivolts. Is it going to become more positive or more negative? Okay, that was awesome. That, that was just people saying the opposite thing louder. Okay, so, <laughs> so I, think, I think the positives win. So sorry, Cody. I can oh, tell that it was you. Oh, that was you! Oh, what's your name? Ryan. Ryan. Well, that, that was even better then, because you made it sound like it came from somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so positive, so positive flowing in, more positive, less negative. It, exactly as it makes sense. Okay, so what that means is that the reason that neurons fire these pulses is when their voltage gets to a threshold. It stays down here very negative, and then they, they sort of integrate a bunch of information. The way they integrate information is by having that voltage change. And if it gets high enough, then it creates a pulse. So this means, so what does this mean? This means that if I expose this cell to light and there's a bunch of these channels in it, will this cell pulse or not pulse? Pulse. Good, good. Okay. All right. So this one does the same thing, it's just a different, to a different color of light. So this one is pumping chloride into the cell. So instead, of, it's not actually a channel, uh, channel. In this case, it's actually something. It's a, it's a little machine that's like pulling the chloride in. So what will happen here? So if, if I if if this cell is ex exposed to the light, this is from a, a desert ba uh, bacteria, by the way, archaeobacteria. Uh, what will happen to the cell? What will happen to the membrane potential? More negative. Great. So, will it be more likely to pulse or less likely to pulse? Awesome. Okay. So, and this is how these bacteria and algae sort of do their stuff. But in the last, say, so somewhere around 2005, somebody had the idea of, let's take these proteins, because that's all these ion channels are, and let's express them in neurons. Because these are just algae right there. So the way that we can do that is that we can take a virus, like uh, HIV. The way HIV normally works is it's a big bundle of DNA, and it has a, some of that DNA is useful for creating the thing that um, uh, copies the virus into the into our into our DNA and gets it to be expressed. And some of it is the DNA that sort of like controls like whatever the response to the immune system is. And then some of the DNA is the thing that sort of creates this package of stuff that can sort of float around in fluid and like stick to a cell. And then all that DNA is wrapped up into this package and then it, and then it sort of goes out and that's how we get infected. Or a cold virus is exactly the same thing, except the cold virus is more application. Um, right, so we can take a virus like that, but we can take out all that machinery. And we can just make that machinery like run in another cell. So now we can package in this viral capsid that we know likes to go into cells, uh, some protein that we like. And if we add to that protein that we like, the piece of DNA that copies that protein into the DNA of the cell, then what we'll get is we'll get something that if we stick it into somewhere near cells and stick them, it'll inject its, its, its uh, contents into that cell. That, and remember the contents are like a copying enzyme, and, or DNA that becomes a copying enzyme, and DNA that becomes a thing that we want. Right, so what we can do is we can take our channel rhodopsin DNA sequence and the DNA copying enzyme, express it in a viral capsid, which we do in some bacteria, and then concentrate it into this really concentrated fluid, and then 
inject it into, say, a rat's brain. And then what we'll get is we'll get neurons that are sensitive to that's my way. Well, okay. I guess if she's here, she'll be able to find where we are, presumably. Yeah. People know where we are, right? This isn't like some secret. Uh, on occasion it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I have no reason to think that she's here. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll wait for the text message. Uh, so, uh, uh, so in fact. I'm going to show you an experiment that I've done in my lab here at some point. I've already talked for half an hour, and we're only on slide three. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's not actually uh, doing this, what I just described, but we do, I, I do actually do this. This is what I did as a postdoc. We're sort of schooling up to do a lot of it And what's really awesome is that you can do this a little bit more complexity. You can make these viral vectors. Um, target specific cells, like specific kinds of neurons. And then that what that means is that when you now shine blue light onto the whole brain, only those genetically selected neurons are going to do what? Pulse, right, become active. Or say instead we express this thing, which is called heliridopsin. And what's going to happen to those neurons? They're going to be quiet. Yeah, so this is really has been super groundbreaking because what this means is that now if we want to subtly perturb how the nervous system is working, we can tar target genetically selected neurons and not just genetically but because we're injecting a virus, like some small spatially selected subset of neurons to have their activity either boosted a little bit or suppressed. So there's people that are talking about doing this to treat something like uh, Parkinson's disease, where uh, your dopamine neurons sort of degrade and eventually most of them die off. And so as a result, your your body is not, it, your brain is not sort of integrating whatever it does with dopamine, it's not doing. Um, and as a result, you have these sort of movement disorders. So there's people that end up having electrical stimulators implanted into their brain to treat Parkinson's disease and it sort of basically that sort of pace the brain becomes even better. Um, but so the thought is, instead of doing that, let's do this all with light. Because light is, first of all, not damaging necessarily unless it's like really bright. Um, and second of all, because we can target the neurons that we want to activate or inactivate with this sort of genetic selectivity. Um, so this is sort of the, the okay, so. Hopefully, by the, the, the end of today, you'll, you'll, you'll be excited about the idea of, of being able to see neurons active, and you'll be excited about the idea of activating neurons in some sort of cool, sci almost science fiction way, but actually what it actually is. Okay, so this is just a picture showing, like, this is, these are some neurons that have been transfected with both of these things, gemmodopsin and heliodopsin, and so if you flash blue light, they pulse, turn on some yellow light, they don't pulse. And so that, the, 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 this is, this is, and these are the viral vectors and genetics. Okay. So, this is a picture, uh, so now that, the microdrive, did it, Matt, did it ever make it past you? Did it make it all the way around? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, What's that? Yes. It didn't make it to the back. You pa pa pass it on to the back. Okay. So, this is a, a picture of what I do. So, this is a, a, a SEM, so it's a scanning electrode microscope picture of the bottom of one of these electrodes, right? So this, a, this is this scale bar is five microns, so these are each about twelve microns, and then twelve mm -hmm. is about forty. Right? And so this is a blown up uh, 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 portion of a slice of. So, you can, so for some reason, they decided the standard way of slicing brains should be to like um, have the eyes going forward and then slice either this way or this way or this way. And just because I'm, I'm giving you loads of random facts, these ones are called coronal, these ones are called sagittal, and these ones are called horizontal. So horizontal totally makes sense, right? Because it's like parallel, it's horizontal. I, when I was first starting in, in neuroscience, I, I could never remember the difference between sagittal and coronal. 
somebody told me this this sort of uh, mnemonic, right? Um, which is that if you were in the French Revolution, you were a king, so you were wearing a crown, and you were being beheaded, and you happened to look up at the wrong moment, then the guillotine would slice a coronal slice. So coronal crown king. So this is a coronal <laughs> slice. <laughs> So hopefully, hopefully you'll remember. You'll be like, oh, Corona. Um, the, uh, this is a, a Corona section. Uh, this is the midline. So this is the the rat's brain is divided into two hemispheres, just like ours. And this is actually just the the top, basically quarter. So it wraps around here, and then there's another about this much on the other side. And this is the piece of the brain that I'm most interested in. This is called the hippocampus. So it's. Uh, very important for memory. Have any of you seen the movie Memento? It's rated R. Um, okay, so sweet. All the stairs raised their hand. <laughs> okay, so well, you're not a Sarah. Oh, yeah, but I thought you were a Sarah too. What's your name? I'm Ruth. Ruth. So Ruth, tell me, can you briefly summarize the plot of the movie? Three sentences. Not the one where the guy couldn't remember and he sent messages to himself everywhere. Yeah, yes. Yeah. That's exactly right. And he was going around killing. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, uh, that movie is based on a real person who lived. Well, he actually just died uh, in 2010, I think. His name was Henry Malaysen, but um, he was studied for like the last 50 years of his life by a bunch of people um, at like Harvard and and, and MIT because he lived in Massachusetts. And the reason he was studying was when he was in his 20s, in 1956, I think, he had seizures. He had epilepsy. It was really bad. They're like, oh, your epilepsy is really bad. It takes a mess, a mess, it didn't work. So I have a seizure. They're like, what we're going to do is we're going to cut out the part of your brain where the seizures are starting. Great idea. So they, they went in and they cut out both of his hippocampus. So it's human hippocampus. So this is the rat's, right? So this is the rat's whole brain. And this is the hippocampus. So you can see in, in a rat, the hippocampus is a big chunk of Brain. And the human brain is not quite as big, it's probably about as big as as, uh, as my thumb, maybe. And it sort of wraps around, so you have your neocortex on the outside, and it wraps around um, above your brain, sit below your neocortex. We cut out both of his hippocampus. So great, the seizures were procured, like recovered from the surgery, and they're like, how's it going? It's going great. And then they realized that he no longer was forming new memories. So you walk into his, his hospital room. He'd be like, nice to meet you. You walk out, you walk, walk back in, and, and 